Hi, everyone. I'm Nicole Alvarez. Welcome to the Odyssey DTS Sound Space. This room that I'm in has seen a lot of magic, and it's about to see some more. Please welcome the Lumineers. This first one is a bright side acoustic. I could see it in the air Every word was like smoke from a cigarette You were blowing in your head The heat had broken the Oldsmobile And the light in your eyes Alone I was stranded in the bed You were listening to the dark side of the moon I could barely see your eyes Still a silent in a hotel room And the light in your eyes And waves on the ceiling I'll be I was trying to believe in a we were right Losing every other friend Finding nothing in the afterlife But the light in your eyes Alone on a feeling I'll be Got a little page 
something on my mind, girl, like a drug. Oh, oh, feel I heaven help a fool falls in love. called Angela and it's uh it's about feeling like you're coming home when you left this town with your windows down and the wilderness inside let the exits pass 
Saw the tar and glass to the road and skyline The strangers in this town They raise you up just to cut you down Oh, Angel, it's a long time coming And your Volvo lights lit up green and white With the city's on the signs But you held your course to some distant wall In the corners of your mind And from the second time around The only love I ever found No angel, it's a long time coming in You safe and warm in your coat of arms with your fingers in a fist. Did you hear the notes, all those static codes in the radio abyss? The strangers in this town, they raise you up just to cut you down. Oh, Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is the Odyssey DTS Sound Space. I'm Nicole Alvarez, and I'm joined by the Lumineers. This is Wes and Jeremiah. Hi, guys. Thanks for having us, yeah. I, um, let's start off with the obvious. I missed you. Did you miss me? <laughs> yeah. You did. You yeah. laughed, yeah, we Wesley. You. you left. We missed playing live shows. The last time we were recounting, the last time we, we hung out was... Uh, it was, out, it was an outside event Weenie three years roast? ago, Weenie Roast. Yeah, and it was right as right Game of beach. Thrones ended because you had done that Game of Thrones song. That's right. We did and that's Nightshade. what we were talking about. Yeah. So I want to start off speaking of live shows. I'm fresh off a live Lumineer show that happened at the Santa Barbara Bowl, and it was, it was a special night. I don't think it was just for me um, because I've seen on your socials you're still buzzing. First of all, kudos for your walkout song, which was <laughs> Rolling Stones, Give Me Shelter. Yeah. By design, or were you just paying homage to the Rolling Stones that night? Well, we we used to we usually try to pick out something that gets us amped for the show. So we had Fleetwood Max, The Chain, mm -hmm. on Cleopatra tour, and then this on three we were using Gimme Shelter, and it got cut short. So it felt appropriate to keep yeah. using it. Um, and then Charlie Watt had just passed away, so the whole thing was just. Uh, it's an emotional song, that, yeah. that whole ride. So it gets us really pumped. We, When I was waiting backstage to go on, I asked for more of the song Ladder. in my ears because I, it was really... Were you, do going. you get all like pumped up before you go on? I was wondering because the audience, like it was very electrifying to be out there and the lights were being dim. You know, the Santa Barbara Bowl is magical in and of itself, but then... Gimme Shelter started playing and you could feel it. And I wondered, are you guys back there like it's boxers? Very, it's a very intense high right before you go on stage. I mean, about 30 minutes before every show, we meet in our green room and we perform a few songs, sometimes four or five songs. We always like to play the first song that we're going to play. So it's not, you know, you're not going from cold in your green room that just to performing. But we're kind of like jumping around like we're about to play the Super Bowl or something. It's very... Uh, <laughs> 
it's a very exciting moment. And then we have this tradition where we shake, you know, there's six of us now, we shake each other's hands, they have a good show, and it's oh, just very awesome. kind of spiritual bonding constant. No matter what city, what country you're in, I think it keeps us grounded and, you know, keeps the love between us all. I have video from that night. Jeremiah, you, you, you're always happy, but this particular night, you were smiling from ear to ear. You look like a naked baby in a candy store. Like you were just like with your drumsticks and you have this huge smile on your face. Is it because you're so excited to be back out because it, it, it has been so long or was, I don't know, were you just drunk? Uh, Kidding. <laughs> That's the first time I've ever heard that description. Of, what was it, naked, naked baby? Naked baby in a candy store. Um, That's yeah, what you look I, like. <laughs> I think, honestly, that was a very special show. Um, I wouldn't consider myself happy all the time, but the cameras were, <laughs> <laughs> cameras were rolling. I, uh, <laughs> I think, Are you happy right now? Yeah. The cameras yeah. are on? Yes. <laughs> um, I think, honestly, for that show, it had been about 18 months. Mm. It felt like forever. It felt like a lifetime had been, you know, slipped through the cracks of, like, it just was really emotional to play that show again. Yeah. We had played a show, I think, a week ago in Boulder, Colorado, uh, very close to our home in Denver, but playing this show in front of a lot more people, newers live stream, getting out to other folks and stuff. It was just a very, it wasn't just like, oh, we got a gig tonight, just another thing. It was like a very big deal to do that yeah, show. We've been rehearsing also in a bubble with the band and the crew to prevent anyone from getting COVID so that we could play all these things we were trying to play this month at the end of it. So it's all these rehearsing yeah. It'd be like if you're an athlete and all you're doing is practicing yeah. and you're not seeing any of the outside world and then you get a game and the whole crowd is there. It's like that where it's such a rush. It's such a and rush, And you right? realize why you had been, you know, rehearsing that hard and that long because it's a lot to learn all these new songs uh, and, and have everyone in the band learn their parts and, you know, have it run smooth. So. A lot yeah. of it was like, this was the fun part. You yeah, know? I'll say too, I was in actually a pretty negative headspace before the show because <laughs> you did not I had like uh, it at all. I had gotten really bad sleep at our hotel, <laughs> yeah. and the night before we did a full rehearsal, and I just messed up this one new song, and I knew we were playing eight new songs, and I think the live stream got in my head where I'm like, normally it's just you play a show, and you know people are going to film some of it, yeah. but I think the live stream it just became this it's like in your face. echo chamber in yeah. my head, and then I think all that nerve, all those nerves, and then all that anxiety, stress, whatever, it just morphed into like pure joy. That exploded on your face. Yeah, it was. It was all. I'm glad it did a 180 and not. The yeah. other way around. I'm going to send you these videos because it's okay. like I, I zoned in on you because you did look like the one time like like Animal in the Muppets just like banging away and smiling and I was like I just want a little bit of that Someone on our management joy. team we played a new song it's called Birthday and someone on our man I think Joe our booking agent was like hey, I loved Birthday and he sent me the Muppet guy <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Groucho, what's his name? Animal. Banging on animal. animal. Banging on uh, trash cans. And I was like, all right. You said something that night about humility that stuck with me because, you know, you called, you called bullshit on humility. The people that win awards and like, this thanks for this humbling moment when really it's not. Right. And what we all went through, the pandemic, that was humbling. Yeah. So in those moments of humility, when all of this that you do was taken away from you for a bit, what did you learn? So being backstage and writing new music, what did you learn and what is different now after the, the humility? Well, it's a combination of things, right? For me, I have, uh, I got to spend a lot of time with my son who's now like three and a half. So between the ages of like two and three and a half, we were together almost every day. And that's not normal for a touring musician. You know, you go through periods where you're with your kids and your family and when you're not. And, um, so watching him get older and realizing that I had just, I had thought of time as frozen when I was touring. And then like, if I was off the road, you sort of, uh, you savor those times, you savor the times on the road, but you never really imagine that you're aging. You're like the frozen person in the ice or something. And then I started to realize that, uh, you know, there, there is a fr fragility and like a finiteness, whatever the right word is, uh, to to a lot of this that that pause gave me it was painful it was a painful pause yeah. it was like I felt like that last album's tour on our three record it was the most gratifying tour experience I had had personally and then it was like you were riding down the street on your bike flying down the hill and someone stuck a stick right in your spokes mm -hmm. it 
it's very jarring. Yep. And so I think for me, uh, it just made me um, sort of think about that a little more and, and, and attempt to be present a lot more than I was. Because I think the mistake I was making was surviving maybe a lot more than I was living or thriving, you know? Yeah. Just like getting through something because you thought you had a bigger task yeah. ahead of you, always thinking of f- for the future. Yeah. And even just being on the stage, you know, a couple nights ago, I was in that moment a lot more, you know, where it wasn't always on to the next song. What am I doing here? And what's the, I was, I wasn't thinking that much. I was, I felt like I was taking things in and that's, that's really beautiful. But the whole thing was, uh, I can't stress it enough. I think the whole thing was pretty traumatic for everybody <laughs> I know. Am I, like, you know, no one got, no one gets out unscathed from, from what hap- from what's been happening. It continues to, to happen a lot to people. So yeah, we're all going, we're all coming out of this strange, strange time, this strange haze. So two things. I'm glad you said the thing about being present. A friend of mine said to me the other day that we're always chasing the next thing. So we're always chasing like the next concert, the next thing, the next responsibility. And every time that we decide to live like that, we are telling ourselves we don't need to be present because I'm too busy chasing the next thing. And that is how you steal time from yourself. One of the things I realized being at the show with you guys Usually when a band plays a new song, that's when people take beer and bathroom break. Yeah. They're like, I don't know this song, I'm out of here. Nobody left. Yeah. And so one of the reasons I know that this new album is going to be spectacular is because of the presence that it allowed me. And sometimes presence is the hardest state to get in, right? But these new songs grounded everybody. And I think the beauty of playing new songs right now, we are at the ground level of a new world. The old world is behind us. So you're providing a soundtrack to this new world. You kept saying, thanks for being patient. We're playing all these new songs, but we were so excited about it. But how nerve-wracking is it for you to introduce new music to your audience who already loves you anyways? Yeah, I think for if you're playing like a room of a hundred, or a few hundred people, I think you get a lot more leeway with an audience. I think if it's, uh, if it's a situation in the, Holly, or in the Santa Barbara Bowl, it was 5,000 people, something like that. And so you have to try to communicate a lot of information in like 15 seconds yeah. of like why they should understand what you're singing about. And so that was to me like the task, that was the challenge, was trying to get someone to care about something that normally they would, like you said, use it as a break for the bathroom. Yeah, or um, beer. And I think, so I think it was a combination of um, trying to do that, trying to mix in old songs with new songs, and also that I think these songs have more of an immediacy than something, some songs in our past, you know? Um, I think there's something truly like, I can play some of these songs from our friends back home who've never heard it, and by the end of the song, they might be singing along. There's something anthemic about them, or, or I don't know what it is, but we were tapping into something um, that felt a little more, we, we, we describe them as slow burns, some of our older songs where, you know, it's that. like your favorite song was the least favorite when you first heard it, that kind of I can thing. See that. Um, and you start to appreciate it, it grows on you and all of a sudden you can't stop listening to it. And I think we always trusted that because that, you don't want to burn something out. You don't want it to feel like, oh, I remember when I listened to that so much and now I can't stand it. I, I like someone just <clears throat> slowly warming up to something and it being with them for their whole life. Um, but for some reason, I think this, this has a different, uh, entry with people okay. where you can just play it and they get it. And I, I want to keep talking about the new music, but I, I've always wanted to say this to you. I think it's clever that you don't do ho at the end because I think most people expect ho to be at the end, yeah. but you like sneak it in what, like third or fourth to not give it, you know, because it is a huge, massive song, but you kind of give it a different place. Yeah. And it's cool because it gives so many other songs time to shine. Clever yeah, there's move. there's like a lot of tension in a room when you don't, when you withhold a song that some people might have come there for. They get straight up pissed. Like, yeah. I, I remember going to see, I saw Jack Johnson when I was like 18 and he had just come out of this album and people wanted to hear the song Bubble Toes. <laughs> and <laughs> they just kept yelling the whole concert, Bubble Toes, <laughs> between every song. And I was like, man, if I ever, if I ever make it, I'm not going to hear some song being shouted throughout the whole set in between. And it was a way of us saying we're, we're, you took control. 
w- yeah, like yeah. we're we're there's a lot more to take in than yes. than maybe this song that you might have got introduced to us through. Um, so we're we're appreciative of that song, but like let's get that out of our yeah, system because there's out. a lot more to take in, and it it we did that I think since album one, so it, it is kind of like it's gratifying because it means that if everybody just flooded the aisles, then we would really good, do a good job of like writing good songs after that. But it, it, when you play it early, it's kind of like a line in the sand, like, okay, yeah. you're here with us now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I yeah. think I've always wanted, the first time I noticed that was it was a show at Terminal 5 in New York years ago and you did it. You yeah. brought out like some kids to sing with you. I think you sang it twice, but I thought that was clever. So good on you. Yeah. Jeremiah. Well, okay, so the new songs. Immediately, Where We Are, Am I Right in Saying That? Is that the title? That's the song, yeah. That's the song. Okay. It's a cool from, song. Yeah. From the get-go, that's a sing-along. So there's artist engagement right away. And that's not the only song. I heard another new one called Birthday Song, which is also like really quick to tap into. Tell me something about those, and then we'll, then we'll dive into what led you to this album. Where We Are had an interesting life to it where it was some of the parts of the song were written Wes and I were in Denver I think during the pandemic we were kind of demoing in my basement and it had a very different um, format than what it does now Um, in fact I remember the way it starts off you know we're talking about song not many people know but people know it eventually they'll know it the way it starts off it actually starts off with the chorus refrain and I remember to Wes's credit he prefaced the idea in the studio hey this is a really bad idea talking to me (laughs) and the producer Simon Felice but what if we tried this? And it was sort of inspired by another song. And I think it was a Talking Heads sort of inspiration. It was... Yeah. Um, where we know where we're going. Yeah, which starts off with this very um, iconic kind of vocal thing. And Wes was like... Road to nowhere. Terrible like, idea, yeah. but Road let's try it. Yeah. And then, or even Can Anybody Find Me Somebody somebody to Love, yeah, like Queen, Queen, where you start it with the hook. And it, had this, uh, it has this very sort of live, energetic piano that took forever to record. I think I recorded it like... It's such a simple part in theory, but it, I tried it on four different pianos because I was just trying to obsessively achieve this thing I heard in my head. And it also features very big drums. I mean, the first single, Bright Side, has very big drums that you would never expect. No, I was Luminaires surprised. Luminaires and drum beats in the same sentence, maybe. But um, after Bright Side, I think that sort of allowed myself to be like, you can be a drummer now finally in this band um so i never really considered myself the drummer though i just write songs with wes and i think we look at songs very harshly for lack of a better word we look at them very objectively what does the song need what does it not need where can we trim the fat so with these songs it wasn't like hey let's add a lot of drums even the song birthday you mentioned um you know a lot of drum beats and things that we just felt like evolved our sound but in a natural sort of stepping stone away from previous iterations that we were doing on, on earlier albums. Is that why you look so happy like a naked baby in a candy <laughs> store? It's because you're like, drums! Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's just, it's really fun to play drums live. You feel like you're sort of on this big ship sometimes. You're in the back, and uh, I didn't know there were that many cameras on my face. They're Apparently there were. <laughs> <laughs> and there was that big screen in the middle, too, and it would, like, focus in on that smile, and you were just beaming. I figured it was the energy because it was so palpable, but... The new songs, though they don't feel like you're playing new songs. I mean, we rehearsed so much this last month and a half, so maybe that's why, but even like sometimes you listen through the crowd's ears and you're like, oh man, this is a new song. They're probably, these songs, I just feel like there's something about the way we wrote them, the way we produced them and finished them that I think there's an immediacy that you can maybe understand them quicker perhaps. I don't know, but playing the songs live and playing the drums and playing with the whole band, it just uh, it just feels physically different than feels right man it just feels feels right right. (laughs) let's get to bright side which is the introduction to the new album which is coming out in january i need it first okay i'm just sliding that in there but um i don't think i've heard a song that that says psilocybin ever in it um it sounds like a love song to me am i wrong yeah i think it is Uh, especially that part (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah um it's it's kind of like for me it was an american look at the love story you know like the highs and the lows and and the idea that i kept imagining you know all of these things falling apart around this couple and then they were they were illuminating each other they were they couldn't see around each other it was just that was all that mattered was the imaginary couple on mushrooms no that was like my own life okay. uh, <laughs> i was 
I can tell you like a, I'll try to abbreviate it. But Please. I was, I'm actually trying to pull it yeah. out because I think I know the story, yeah, but I want to entertain the masses. So you have to understand that we travel for a living, obviously, and that when someone... So my wife won this trip, which sounds like to anyone else sounds like the greatest thing ever to go on a trip to Mexico. And it was like the worst thing I could imagine coming off of like a year and a half of touring. And I just wanted to be in my own bed and around my dogs and just like stuff I knew. I know this restaurant. I know where I'm going. I'm not lost every day. And um, so I got home. We, we, we headed to the airport for this trip uh, that she won on this raffle. And I was like, I can't do this. I can't get on another plane. I'm going to like lose my mind. So we actually like got out of the Uber and pretended that we had been on a trip and got in another Uber back home. <laughs> and and we got there and I was like, well, I don't want to get in a plane, but I, if you want to take a road trip, maybe we get in a car. That'd be nice. We could spend some time together. We drove out to Telluride. And, um, and she had unbeknownst she had brought these mushrooms that were she said were years old and were like stale she's like oh these aren't any good anymore so you got to eat a lot of them to make it work and she covered like a whole piece of pizza uh and she said yeah eat these and you'll be fine and i'll eat some too and and they turned out they were like regular potency and so um i was in the the line as i was stranded in the bed like you were listening to the dark side of the moon. I put on dark side of the moon and we were just in a hotel room because we couldn't even leave. We had been outside and I was like, this is too much. I'm seeing like a wolf in that mountain over here and this, um, and waves in the ceiling. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was the idea that, um, we, I was with someone and I felt like totally safe, even though I was like out of my mind. Uh, we were there together and we're listening to, to music brought us together. You know, it was like, Dark Side of the Moon. She had never really listened to it in its full, in the full album sense. And so we just listened to it on loop. And it was this beautiful experience um, that if I was in another environment, it could have been like really confusing. You know, like you see people at concerts sometimes and you're like, oh, I feel bad for that person. Yeah. But this was like a sanctuary. I'm usually that person. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so the idea is just being, being with, being with someone and feeling safe, even though you're sort of like tripping out. Um, and uh, psilocybin is is a actually like a beautiful word to sing. Turns out, like yeah. it's the California of drugs or something. You know, like <laughs> everybody has everybody says Californian songs. You know, it's yeah. just like I think there'll be a trend. That oh wow, say, that's yeah. a good point. That that's it seems to be a subject matter that a lot of people are <laughs> writing about, talking about, yeah. dabbling in, and whatnot. Do you two um, do you two ever fight? You have this beautiful friendship and brotherhood that we see, you know. And I've seen you sound check, stage, communicate in your own little language. Um, do you ever have to let it come to blows in order to kind of break the Not glass like ceiling? Physically fight, Not physically, but, yeah, we, but like get out of my face. Yeah, I mean we, I mean we made we realized we've been making music for 16 years this past August. So there's been some. I wouldn't say. It's not like we're the Gallagher brothers or something, but we are kind of like, I think like brothers where things boil up, that reaches a pressure point and we'll get in a big argument. And then I think we're, to our credit, we're pretty good at working through it. It's not like there's these yeah. Yeah. areas of time where for it's sure. like we don't talk for for months or years or something. It's just more, it's like we're we're sort of brothers just born out of, music and our love for that we spent so much time like our wives are like joke that they're you know you're kind of soulmates we're each married to the other person's you know this was this was faded right here before i let you guys go um you have such a huge fan base and they're so loyal what did you do to make contact with your fans throughout the madness the humble session let's call it yeah (laughs) the humble session you mean like virtually and yeah, virtually, yeah. Did you do live streams or, or we did things some like live that? streams? Um, the live streams were were helpful. We we tried to do like we didn't want it to just be like I'll do a live. We we did a lot of like charity things to support like the restaurants, let's say in Denver or musicians through Music Cares and things like that. Um, but it's hard. I mean, I don't I don't know that there's a substitute for a live show. So. Part of it was just trying to say, hey, I'm going to play. Like, I remember playing Gale Song one day and posting it. And there was something like 700 comments that day. And I was like, oh, people, hey, people like that song more than I realized. But also, like, they needed to hear something. They needed a lullaby 
you know, to make the day a little bit better. And um, I think that was one way. And each of us putting out solo records, um, I think that was another way to do something to connect. Because I think they can have some of us, but honestly, you're getting our you're getting our music first and foremost from us. You know, like you don't really. No one knows you like you half time. You don't know who you are, <laughs> but I feel like just trying to give what you make some beauty out of it was our way to I think. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Try to help a little bit, you know, with like a difficult time because um, the virtual thing is drives me a little crazy. It got uh, a little. It got a. It got a little too much there towards yeah. the end. Like now, I'm I'm very put <laughs> off by it for yeah. a second. Like I don't want to see any of it. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's like I, a living room show, living room show, yeah, and it's like that was cool in the beginning, and now it's like if yeah. you see another one yeah. of those. When we IG were, Live. Like when we were doing touring very early on, we were literally playing in people's living rooms, and that was pretty cool. That was cool. And I, like I don't, it's nothing like the virtual <laughs> living room yeah. where. Yeah. There's such a palpable energy. So I think everybody, I hope everybody is like sort of reminded of like there's no substitute for what human contact. Have. You yeah, know, like what we have. how we all commune together. Being in, we we played to a fraction of the amount of people that were at the Santa Barbara Bowl before that. And then seeing that massive amount of people, um, it do, it truly like affects you physically. You're like, Whoa, like yeah. it's, it makes you feel for a moment like you're not alone. It it's was interesting too because yeah. Wes and I live in, I live in Italy, but I still have my house in Denver and I kind of live wherever the band is working at the time. And uh, I was back in Denver and I drove my own personal car from Denver up to the Boulder show and I was pulling into the alleyway and two fans immediately recognized me. They were waiting to go on the show and I'm like pulling in my car and it just was like, oh, yeah, pe- this happens. Like, people yeah. come into the show, and there was a huge line of people. And it was really exciting. I felt like I hadn't seen or interacted with people in two years. And you, like, feel awkward, but you're like, oh, this is starting to bring back really positive memories. All of, of the feelings. All the feelings, All of the yeah. feelings. Yeah. Um, I'm going to wrap it up. Yesterday, I went to see this singer-songwriter that I love so much named Frank Turner, who's one of my favorite poets, much like you all are. And he was – he stood – a lot of times in between songs, like in awe of the fact that he was in front of people and watching everybody sing. And he said something that hit me. He said, communal singing is so important because it turns everything from a monologue to a dialogue. And we're all in a relationship together. And that power, uh, it's just priceless. And Lumineer shows have the greatest engagement of most any shows that I go to. So it's been great to have that dialogue with you guys and to sing with you. So thank you for everything. I need that new album ASAP. And I'm <laughs> we'll not even you. joking. I know people. We'll leak, we'll um, leak it to you. Don't worry. Thank you. And I look forward to Bright Side coming out. Do we have an exact date? I don't know. I know it's like early next year. Um, I feel like January 14th Which is five, minutes, which is five uh, minutes from now. Like yeah. literally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, which is five minutes from now. Well, thank you so much, yeah. Wes, Jeremiah. It's always a pleasure. Thank you all for thank watching. You. I'm Nicole Alvarez, The Lumineers.